Hello, welcome to Bookworms. I'm Alex. And I'm Joe. You son of a bitch, how are you? Good, how are you, little uh, brother? You can Emphasis go... on little. <laughs> you can go right to hell with that. This is the show where we read books and then talk about those books. We love talking about books. We love talking about books that we love. And this is not what we're going to have this week. Because this week we read The Butcher and the Wren. It was my pick. And it was delightfully terrible, especially listening to Alex groan constantly through text. Why? Why did you make me read this? And that's how I'd like to start this podcast today, by asking that question. Why did you make me read this? (laughs) Well, first, we have a special guest with us today. The person that got me to read this book, my lovely wife, Rebecca. Hello. It's me. I'm the problem. So, Alex wants to know why we read this book? Well, it all started with Rebecca getting me hooked on a podcast called Morbid, a true crime podcast, where the author of this book, Elena Urquhart, and her niece, Ash, talk about true crime. And, yeah, they're a pretty funny, quirky pair of women and tell an enjoyable story. And... Elena decided to do a cash grab and write a book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I uh, I haven't listened to Morbid. Uh, well, I, tr- I tried to listen to Morbid. Uh, I made about 15 minutes into an episode, then I realized that this book is no fluke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the biggest into true crime myself. I prefer, like, comedy style. Unicorns. Yeah, unicorns. Com- ponies. Ben ponies, yes. I like to write them backwards. It's a lot of fun. But I ever for comedy podcasts, things like that, no, stupid, stupid stuff. So it's not my thing. If you guys like it, great. But uh, it wasn't my stuff. I, it's definitely one of those things where I bounce between different true crime podcasts. It's definitely not my main thing. You know, it kind of got me into podcasts initially. But yeah, it's it's definitely an entertaining podcast. Usually, I love Morbid. But yeah, this book was bad. <laughs> so yeah. So when Alex and I both decided to make a podcast, we came up with a book list of seven books that we really liked and then one book we thought the other person would not like. And I had just read this book for the first time. And I'm like, oh boy, do I have a good book for that category. Yeah, yeah, you uh, you hit it out of the park with that one. Good job. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, what I do best. Anyways... So, Alex, I just want you to know, even though you know you thought this book was painful, I had to read it twice. <laughs> and my... did not get better the second time around. That's my only solace at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's get right into it. I'll read. Yeah, cause what, what is this book about? I, I read it, and I'm not entirely sure. So, this is The Butcher and the Wren by Elena Urquhart, and the cover description reads as thus a methodical serial killer with a penchant for medical experimentation is hard at work competing his most harrowing crime yet taunting the authorities who desperately try to catch up but forensic pathologist dr wren muller is the best there is armed with an encyclopedic knowledge of historical crimes and years of experience working in the medical examiner's office she never encountered a case she couldn't solve until now. Case after case is piling up on Ren's examination table, and soon she is sucked into an all-consuming cat-and-mouse chase with a brutal murderer getting more brazen by the day. An addictive read with straight from the morgue details only an autopsy technician could provide. The butcher and the Wren promises to ensnare all who enter. And uh, some quick spoilers front-loaded. Uh, the serial killer is not really methodical and uh, does very little experimentation. He doesn't even know where the C5 is. I mean, come on. Did you have to look that up, Alex? No, I knew that offhand. Everybody knows where the C5 vertebrae is. You know, C5, <laughs> stay alive. Am I right? <laughs> so, so, yeah, uh, this is a lot of false advertising for sure. I don't think. Elena hit really any of these points that the opening comes up with. I would have expected somebody like Dr. Addie from Bones, or Bones herself, with this build-up. 
But that did not happen. Yeah, and who's the uh, the big bad that scares you so much in that show? Pallant. Yeah, that that kind of says. Yeah. That that, that would have no. you know is what you're expecting, for sure. <laughs> Let's get right into it. Let's see. I think we we have a couple gripes. The other time I picked a book for uh, Cold Town, Alex had a major problem with the opening sentence. I think we can go with that again for the first paragraph of the book. Alex, do you want to read that? Well, the first paragraph of the book, chapter one, I don't have a huge problem with. Uh, chapter two the one is the one that got me. So uh, the structure of this book, it alternates. Every odd chapter is told from the point of view of Jeremy, our lovely serial killer. And all the even chapters are told through the point of view of Wren, our forensic pathologist. So uh, first, well, before we get into that chapter two, let's talk about Jeremy a little bit. Well, let's, here see, let's, let's start with you know, reading that first paragraph or two, if you don't mind, Alex. Right. So of chapter one. Yeah. Okay. Jeremy hears the screaming through the vents, hears it but doesn't react. His nighttime routine is essential. The mundane, everyday tasks that he engages in make him more himself. The simple act of wrenching on the ancient faucet in his tiny bathroom vanity grounds and centers him. His night usually ends standing in front of his mirror. He is freshly showered, and, normally, he follows it with a close, leisurely shave. He likes to crawl into bed with a clean body and mind. He takes the time to ensure these preparations happen nightly, regardless of any outside disruption. So... We've got an immediate uh, adverb problem here. That's saying it mildly. Yeah, and the next paragraph doesn't get any better. Words like particularly and all that gross stuff come through. My guess reading through this book is Elena did not consult any books or take any writing classes on creative writing because generally, well, as we learned in Cold Town, generally... Uh, you don't want to start a book with someone waking up, which she avoided, thankfully. But the next rule is you don't use a lot of adverbs in your creative writing. Uh, Stephen King said in one of his writing books that she clearly didn't read, the road to hell is paved with adverbs. And she just installed a super highway. So good for her. I, I do believe when Stephen King you know, said or wrote that shortly afterwards, he did publish a book that did just that too, though, didn't he? I don't know, probably. Stop dissing the king. King Horbro. But also, Jeremy is supposed to be sort of like this manly man, this masculine fellow, and yet when it said he has a nightly routine, I was thinking of skin care. Which is fine, you do you, boo, but doesn't seem in character. It definitely comes off as a, like a boring character. It's just for someone that's supposed to be some scary, evil mastermind, and it's like, I have a nightly routine, and the screaming that I am causing is just throwing me way off. Yeah, he's all over the place in this first chapter. Like, yeah, he's got this nighttime routine, and then I, we we don't slow, we find out pretty quick that there are people locked in his basement that he's uh, busy torturing, and then he uh, randomly jumps to backstory of him with his parents, and you know, it's, it's all over the place. It's and, and you also get a an immediate hint that Elena really doesn't like him she's kind of you know has a very big disgust for his character you know she has basically she's just writing it the most disgusting thing she can think of of a of a person and doesn't doesn't really enjoy writing about him which is a, a huge problem i mean you think about all the greatest villains you know think like the joker lex luther those kinds of people they're they're compelling the most of these serial killers that people follow, you know, in real life, you know, have this compelling story to them that just draws you in. Yeah, it's that these people are doing disgusting things, disgusting acts, but they're still drawing you in. Where Elena's every time she starts to draw you in, all of a sudden says, "This guy's just this nasty, filthy creature." And I think she kind of falls into a like a true crime pitfall because she covers people in real life and in real life people do things without motivation and it's fascinating like she name drops Jeffrey Dahmer in the first chapter kind of to compare her character with him however in writing normally you want your characters to have some sort of motivation so he's just a serial killer and doesn't really never really gets into why he's a serial killer 
Why? Where does he get these murderous urges? What's his motivation for ki- picking the people that he wants to pick? And he intentionally doesn't have an M.O., and that just makes him just almost more boring than mm-hmm. someone who does have an M.O. And, and he... You know, his backstories that we keep getting sucked into don't really have anything compelling to kind of be like, yeah, there's something that right there that could make someone into a serial killer. It's just kind of everyday things of a crappy childhood. And also, he's supposed to have this, what is it, medical experimentation thing, but the people are just hanging out with an IV of hydrating fluid. Yeah, he's just he's just torturing <laughs> them. He's he's not like, experimenting. No, he's ripping out fingernails he's and not pulling Dr. teeth. Doctor Frankenstein. He's he's not dissecting them while they're still alive or hooking them up to some strange mm-hmm. contraption to see to get readings out of them. Yeah, even later on when he's hunting them through the Louisiana Bayou, it's just a game of cat and mouse. He's not you know taking notes on their reactions to certain stimuli. He's just trying to kill them in a fun way. So let's uh, go on to that chapter two bit there before we get too deep into Jeremy. Let's talk about the introduction to Dr. Wren. Alex, let's read the opening chapter chapter two. two. The Louisiana air feels impenetrable, even at this early hour. Forensic pathologist Dr. Wren Muller is still blinking the sleep from her eyes as she steps out of her car and into the muggy night. She checks her watch and cringes, thinking about how great it would be if criminals could take their nefarious dealings out of the 2 a.m. hour for a couple of months at least. Yeah, so you have some problems, Alex? <laughs> uh, y- yeah. <laughs> Please, enlighten us. So, it's a short paragraph. She twice describes how thick the Louisiana air is. Uh, her introduction for the character is blocky. She's, it's not just Ren Muller or Dr. Ren Muller, it's forensic pathologist Dr. Ren Muller. And she's, it doubles down on how tired she is, and she's doing weird things like cringing. Like, she looks at her watch, just, oh, it's so early. I feel like, as a professional doctor, you can, I don't know, she wouldn't, number one, she wouldn't be doing that, and also number two, that was just a terrible attempt at humor there, which, of which Urquhart has many. Just over overly worded, yet not saying much. So I wanted to propose a little game here early on in the podcast, where we try and int- uh, do our own introductions, because we, we've read and we understand who Dr. Ren Muller is as a person. How do we give that good first impression of, of this person? Yeah, so Alex came up with the task of, can you write a better introduction, you know, as in easy challenge or as a hard challenge write a worse introduction yeah and so all three of us have written an introduction we're going to share them out now becky's going to judge who's the best i understand the uh flaw in this plan because she also wrote one she can she's allowed to choose herself she's not going to do that though because she's fair and balanced to her own favor (laughs) all right well joe joe why don't you go ahead and share yours first You, you really want me to go first yes please okay get it over with are you doing better or worse? We're going with worse. Dr. Ren Muller, forensic pathologist and coffee holic, pulls her van over in the hut and humid bayou midsummer night. Near a dozen gators splash in the water at the sound of her car door slamming as Ren makes her way to the brightly lit crime scene. A swarm of mosquitoes dive bomber frizzy hair and Ren hopes that no 80s Egypti better known as the yellow fever mosquitoes, are biting her. Wren's other thoughts drift to why killers have to be such night owls and cut into her sleep so often. Oh, that was very good. (laughs) (laughs) That was was more encyclopedic, (laughs) encyclopedic, if I can talk, than anything we saw in the book. I feel like you captured her essence with that. That was 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 amazing. So, so... Definitely uh, worthy yes. of a uh, bad very ni- intro. <laughs> very nicely overly worded. Got a lot of boring stuff in there, too. Oh, like, you know, I, I thought the uh, the whole thing with the yellow fever mosquito, just a pointless factoid that has nothing to do with the story, was kind of the, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. cherry on top. <laughs> Alex, why don't you go next, okay. since you seem so excited for this. Okay. And are you doing better or worse? I'm, I'm going with better. I was also playing with Urquhart 
every time uh, someone is listening to a song, she always gives you the song title and artist because she's very kind like that. So I, I played with that a little bit. <laughs> the Louisiana air was muggy, even in the darkness of this incredibly late night. Dr. Ren Muller, forensic pathologist, drove her, sever, uh, her Chevy Silverado through the soupy, stiflingly hot air. Her car speakers played Timber by Pitbull featuring Kesha. Forensic pathologist Dr. Ren Muller hoped the 2013 worldwide hit would help wake her from the f her foggy head because she was still clinging to the cobwebs on this dark and muggy night. If only serial killers could be considerately caring for her in it, for her internal clock, that way, she could get a few Z's in before having to do something silly, like her job, a forensic pathology. It's going down. <laughs> yeah, that, that I'm ready for what, questions yeah, and comments. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Becky, let's uh, hear yours. Okay, I went for worse, and I teach middle schoolers, so I tried to put it in their language. In the bayou, clothing sticks to one's bits no matter the hour. Unalive person poker and cutter upper, Dr. Ren Muller is still wiping sleep crusties away while getting out of her air-conditioned car. Looking at her watch and arm sweat, she wishes criminals wouldn't be asshats at 2 a.m. for a while. That's amazing. Poker. <laughs> I hardly know her. <laughs> <laughs> Which one would you vote for, Becky? Okay, well, best is obviously Alex. <laughs> and and why? <laughs> and why, might I ask? Go on. Because you're the only one in the best category. That's true. <laughs> By default. So who, so. Had, who had the worst then? <laughs> who won out of you and me for the worst? Yeah. Mm, I don't know. I mean, mine's more relatable, especially to those Gen Z people who don't like the word death. But mine's just terrible. Terrible, awful, no good. Yeah. So we'll call it a draw. We'll call it a draw. Fair enough. As long as we all agree I won. <laughs> okay. Moving on again. So, yeah, that's just a little way of summing up her writing style through this. And then we can we can go on just about how terrible some of the like, the wording and the the Yeah, let, let's go on random this. insertions are, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, So it, we, so it, we will go on. Yeah. I mean, to I don't want to be completely terrible here. It is easy to tear a book apart, especially a poorly written one. And Elena is definitely a decent person, and we are being kind of rough with her. It's nothing against her. It's yeah. just the, no, the book is, yeah. came out poor. Yeah. This I is had really high hopes for this book because I love you, Morbid. Yeah, and this is her first uh, first book. She's first draft. <laughs> possibly the first draft of a first book and she she's got a career as a, a mortician she has a success she's not a mortician oh, those what are is she at then? funeral homes she is an autopsy technician so not, not different quite, buildings yeah. the, the, the not part quite of a pathologist yeah. either so okay. this is like yeah. a, what she hopes yeah. to become yeah. the part yeah. i was listening to the 15 minutes she mentioned like how, much, how she has to put her full body weight to snap a clavicle but. Yeah, morticians don't do that. Morticians make you pretty after you die. Fair enough. Elena fucks you up. <laughs> yeah, so well, she, she's got a successful career, a successful podcast. This book was clearly... The book is a successful yeah. seller. Yeah, just... she got a, yeah, she got a good book deal because she's successful in something else. And this was either a first draft that got rushed to production or she... Her editor must have just edited the hell out of it to get it to this from whatever her first draft was, and then kind of gave up after that and be like, "All right, we'll roll with it." It's yeah, legible. Let's let's put all the hate on the editor. They screwed up. They made her look bad. How dare they? Yes, her, the editor's name is uh, Serena, by the way. Yeah, so as, as I read the, the acknowledgments. <laughs> oh gosh, I didn't read this part. <laughs> To my amazing editor, Serena, I feel like the universe put us together. The second we met, you got me. You got my story. And you helped me turn it into what it was always meant to be. I appreciate you so much. You made this book happen, and you made it the best it could be. That is not high praise. Even Jeremy would be impressed by you. And that's both impressive and terrifying. <laughs> I'm so glad you took a chance on the weird little world I created. So, yeah. Becky's just hiding her face right now. <laughs> yeah, she just went red all of a sudden. 
what? <laughs> so I don't know if any of you listen to 372 pages, we'll never get back. Definitely a podcast worth checking out. This is a kind of book that they read, and you know I highly hope that they somehow hear about this and do this book, because they will make it funny and hilarious. Yeah, we're doing you a favor. We're only doing one episode on this book. The... They do like 50 pages an episode, so this would be <laughs> some in the neighborhood of five episodes of having to listen through this. <laughs> yeah, but they do make it entertaining. They do. They have a higher production budget than we do. Or just you two are really awkward. I'm not awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and back to the book. <laughs> the truth hurts. Yeah, so, yeah, the story goes on. Ren is examining bodies. And Jeremy is creating bodies. So we're swapping back and forth between Ren and Jeremy. The plot twist in the middle that started off as okay, then got really hinky because she just, uh, Lena just couldn't quite write it well enough, was that we were looking at two different timelines. Yeah, so as you read through part one and a little bit into part two, you start to realize like their storylines aren't lining up at all. Like, Ren is trying to find a body that's been buried underground, and Jeremy is torturing and killing three people in the Louisiana Bayou. And there's very little to that's aligning that up. And so we find out that Jeremy's storyline is set in the past. Yeah, and you find out that Ren is actually one of his attempted victims. And, you know, the whole... Did we do the joke with the, the C5 at the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. See if I stay alive, baby. Yeah, that he somehow misses her spinal cord in stabbing her. He attempts to paralyze her. And there's a couple paragraphs talking about C5 and how if you stab him in the C5 vertebrae, they're going to be paralyzed for life. And then he does not stab her in the C5. Yeah, all this build up, And then he stabs her in the lower back and can't even get it in the right spot. This supposed meticulous killer that's so terrifying and cunning and you know, Hannibal lecter <laughs> And Alex is speechless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you guys take it for a while. I gotta lie down. <laughs> Do you have any comments, Becky? About the C5? Or anything. Yeah. yeah we, what, what was your opinion on that first plot twist that Ren is a victim of Jeremy, or Cal as she knew him? I, well, okay. First, I'm not very good at figuring out mysteries because my brain is two steps ahead of what my eyeballs are actually seeing or no it's the other way around my eyeballs are faster than my brain there we go so i didn't see that coming i thought it was interesting not well executed yeah i was in the same vein as that it could be the cool thing that you find out i i would have i mean if i had written this book because you know i'm a writer i I write books but if i had written this (laughs) Totally bestsellers that have sold millions of copies. Yes, tens and tens of copies. Well, ten copies. But hey, it adds up. <laughs> so I think the the premise of having a victim come back to work on fresh cases from somebody who terrorized them earlier in their life is an interesting concept. Yeah, and there's something that's been done in other thrillers. I was I kept thinking of uh, Mr. Mercedes by Stephen King, where he's being tortured by a killer who he was trying to catch before his retirement and like that's really engaging because we have them in like we have the little backstory of what that serial killer did and then we have then it jumps to the future and they're both on that same timeline so we get to see the fresh torture that this killer is doing and the cops reaction to it we don't get that in this style of writing though we get we get a confusing storyline where we think it's happen concurrently but it's not and you get that loss of seeing the serial killer plan out how he's going to torture this this woman that he had attempted to kill seven years in the past then so we get almost like ren's backstory without knowing it but we get nothing from the serial killer's perspective on what's happening in the moment with why he was burying a corpse alive, or burying a corpse alive, burying a body alive for the doctor to find. Like, we don't really get to see that happen. And when she digs into Jeremy's psyche and what he's thinking, he's kind of boring. Like he, His thoughts don't really follow what 
at least dramatically what you would hope to be you know serial killer thinking is just kind of mundane parts of his past and being annoyed that his victims aren't doing exactly as he pictured it yeah jeremy really defeats himself because minor things go wrong in his plans and he can't take it anymore and he winds up making those mistakes because he can't handle anything less than perfection which is silly to me i'm not a seal killer so i don't know how that works i got nothing (laughs) (laughs) you could disagree with me like i agree you are not a serial killer but that that's the problem is you look like a serial killer, Alex. Bland. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeremy, terrible serial killer compared to some of the biggest serial killer names, but still exactly nothing like them. Ren, who's kind of a whiny doctor. And for someone that's supposedly... Well, she's whiny in some cases. She's rude and sarcastic in others. She's friendly and compassionate in other places. There's no real lockdown on who she is as a person. Yeah. And then we get a whole slew of other characters that we either don't get names for, or we do get names, but they really don't have a purpose other than just to have someone for Ren to talk to. Her, all of her technicians... I mean, what does she have, like, two or 12? I, I don't really know. And yeah, there's really they're only all... one that gets a name. The rest are, like, bumbling idiots. Yeah, it's just like, why are they here? Why is she the only pathologist in a giant city like New Orleans? You'd think there'd be multiple pathologists, but it makes it sound like she's the only one and with just a bunch of bumbling idiot technicians. You got two cops. One is LaRue there, or whatever it is kind of just all over the place also you got his partner who's barely mentioned until the end you got her husband who barely mentioned until she needs dialogue with him it's just, it, it's it's a it's a mess oh alex is looking at his notes <laughs> i'm jumping around too much for him no it's all good it's like you've made him jeremy <laughs> <laughs> and i'm trying to be all methodical with my delivery and made a few mistakes now and i just throw it all out the window i'm gonna go pick try and pick up this horny woman and kill her good thing we're not live (laughs) (laughs) we can edit out all the magic of editing you're editing this one so i should say more i should say um more often i could always leave that in alex and make you sound like a moron so (laughs) you can watch that i'll leave in every time you say kinda Uh oh the wife's (laughs) shaking her head (laughs) There's so much that could have been done with the Louisiana and New Orleans setting. Okay, but first and foremost, she didn't do a lot of research about Louisiana because she calls the counties, counties, they're not counties, they're called parishes. Louisiana was a Catholic state, a Catholic, (laughs) like, died in the wool, Catholic place. So they had parishes based upon the churches. They're not counties. Anyway. The only things that were well researched were the things that she already knew. She, like, she mentioned several serial killers like Dahmer, and she also mentions the BTK killer, who, who she doesn't like. Yeah, who she doesn't like. Oh my goodness, you don't like the BTK killer, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, which he's probably the closest to Jeremy in this case because he's someone who wrote letters taunting the police uh, about his killings. But really, like even even simple stuff, she hasn't researched beyond what's outside of her job or her podcast. Because, like, here's, here's a sentence, for example. Even in Louisiana, people are captivated by the tale of a love-struck prison worker helping two convicted murderers escape like a real-life Shawshank Redemption. Which, my only note was, Urquhart has not seen the Shawshank Redemption. None of the flavor of that part of the United States is shown at any point. Even during the... Was it was it a parade? Was it a pageant? I don't even know where she finds the Brandon body underneath oh, the, the, the yeah the, the concert. There was nothing there. Granted, I have never been to New Orleans. I've only watched TV shows where it was set or you know documentaries about New Orleans, but there was nothing. There was nothing. No flavor. Well, like Interview with a Vampire, set in New Orleans, and you get a full history of New Orleans in that book, and it's very well done it's gorgeous you see all the old buildings and you see all the celebrations that they have throughout the year this is just 
it's a place. Yeah, it could have easily been set in Florida. Yeah, it could have been the Florida Everglades and says Louisiana Bayou. It could have been like she's from Boston. Could have been Mobile, Alabama. Yeah, she's from uh, she's from Massachusetts, correct? Yes. Okay. So yeah, she could have done any forested wilderness in New England. She could have set it in Maine. She's probably been to Maine a few times. Like, <laughs> get north. Uh, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> go go twenty miles off the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. There's nothing in Maine. You can hunt a body there for years, and no one would know. It'd be a lot of fun to do investigations there. So Louisiana is just a just a place, just like a lot of her characters are just stuffed shirts who say things to help Ren find plot points. So yeah, Alex, I think you have a list of dumb sentences you had put out. Do you want to read any of those for us? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, 372 pages. They do this at the end of their show. They uh, choose their favorite sentences from the book. That they ever read. They have a little uh, song that they play for it. Which I don't want to get dinged for copyright, so I will not sing it here. <laughs> so yeah, I just came up with a... I, I was reading through, I noticed like some really dumb sentences, especially in the dialogue. So I, I, I just I pulled out my favorite, like, 10 or 12. So how about we lower, limit it to 5 or 6, then? Oh boy, you gotta make me pare it down? Oh gosh. Alright, well, my first one was, I'm no murder police. Read them out loud, Alex. <laughs> oh gosh, you're making me you making me do this live. I, I, I don't forgive you for this. Oh. So this next one needs a little bit of context. So Jeremy was torturing three people in his basement, a man and two women. He kills the man, and he's watching the two women run away. And he says, "Best of luck, ladies, and well, actually, just ladies now." Uh, this one's actually two sentences. Ren is discovering things. It says, all at once, like an unpredictable hemorrhage, Ren can smell it. It's subtle. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> what does that mean? I, I, what, is the, what is the episode from Schitt's Creek where David is like, I have never heard so many things wrong. That's just word salad. Like, what does a hemorrhage <laughs> smell like? <laughs> can hemorrhages smell? I guess it's I mean, I very guess subtly, I guess. I guess you're smelling the blood. I mean, you, so you have that kind of irony smell. Okay, yes, but generally hemorrhages happen on the inside, right? No, you can hemorrhage on the outside. I mean, yes, I, I did that. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> sorry, TMI. <laughs> but still, how is it subtle? Like, a hemorrhage isn't subtle. There's no subtlety. I mean, was it an attempt at humor, or... I, I, I don't like, think so. Like, should we be going wink, wink, or something <laughs> afterwards? I don't, I, I don't know, man. It's just like, I guess it's sort of like, I guess it's saying like out of nowhere, because like a hemorrhage can come out of nowhere. Right. But then she goes to a different sense altogether with smell. It's subtle. <laughs> uh, let, let's do a new, new sentence. I might have to do more than five. Go for it. These are these are just hilarious. <laughs> I, I should I shouldn't have limited you. I I, I take I it back, know. Alex. Okay. So this is when Jeremy is uh, again chasing the women through the bayou. He smiles and picks up his pace a bit as Don't Fear the Reaper by Blue Oyster Cult begins to play. He is the Reaper tonight. I mean, I'm going to give her credit. Like, There are some pretty good tunes in this book. I want the playlist. I mean, the movie playlist has already been written. She doesn't have to worry about that. So when, the, when that part comes along. Good songs. Awkward just dropping them in there. I'm not going to lie. Like every time I, I cringe. I cringe. Yeah. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> she gave the title and the artist. <laughs> right, here's the next one. This is when uh, Ren, uh, they find the dead body that's been buried. Well, she was buried alive, but she's now dead. She's examining the this girl, Emma, who's just been, uh, who's just recently passed away. Ren moves onto the legs Emma's parents spoke of with pride to any doctors or nurses who would listen. Creepy! <laughs> So creepy. Oh yeah, our dead daughter. She was a runner. Okay, um, well, I can't yeah, lie. She had legs like a gazelle. I can't lie. I'm a middle schooler wrote a short story about his friend's legs. I'm not gonna lie, and that was disturbing to read, and edit and review with the student, because I had to then look at the student's legs to make sure it was factual. <laughs> that was just <laughs> the most awkward thing. <laughs> I got two more. Uh, they both are when Jeremy, in part two, he's 
just messed up his murder plans, so he go, wants his, wants to go kill someone real quick. So he goes to a bar, he picks up this woman, Tara, who is a lawyer who is just begging to get laid. And snort coke. So the first one. She draws out the long A in an obvious effort to appear seductive, and he almost pulls a muscle trying to stop his eyes from rolling. I feel it's a little on the nose to have a story set in the South with a character named Tara. Just saying. Also, that's, that's another issue I had with her writing, is these are grown-ass people, and they all roll their eyes. At pe- other, like She has like police officers standing there, like, oh my god, I can't believe you're making me do this. I can't even right now. So, very teenage behavior from grown professional people. Yeah. My final one, though, under her grown woman's exterior, she is just a horny teenage boy. I need a bath. I, I, I feel her pain. <laughs> <laughs> Those those are my sentences. There there were other ones in there, but I don't think anything can stop or top a uh, horny teenage boy, <laughs> female lawyer. I probably could have picked out a bunch of sentences. A bunch of the sentences you did read, you know, definitely stood out to me also. But I was doing my best not to just like felt like I was getting nitpicky at times. Other times it's just like I I, I just got to keep reading, otherwise I will never finish this book again because about every other paragraph it's like i i need a comment on something that was just dreadful that i just read there was one sentence i don't have it written down i'm not meticulous like alex over there but it was about how sound can manipulate emotions really really that's what sounds can do i never would have thought of that it's an original concept because i haven't sat for hours watching the disney trailer remakes of Tangled being creepy as fuck, or Frozen being creepy compared to then their sugary regular one. She's really good at stating the obvious, and yeah. Yeah, well, like we were saying earlier, like she hasn't done any research outside of her job and her podcast. So that basic knowledge of music manipulating your emotions, that's, that's high science for her. I mean, when we were talking about Holly Black... I had made a comment about how she had really done a lot of research in psychology and whatnot. Yeah. Even just with like vampires, like she, yeah. Well, I mean, she she was yeah. uh, Holly Black was yeah. the name dropping some big yeah big the time references she made to vampire uh, literature. Is yeah, and, and and she was concept dropping big concepts in psychology, and here's a book that should be pushed up front, and it's just. A hack job, like you said, not research at all. And it's like that's kind of what the whole idea of having a serial killer is: is their what's broken in their brains. Yeah, I'd hate to say it, but this book could be longer and really delve into that, and probably be a much more engaging story. Oh yeah, definitely. So she has a good concept here, a good idea for a story. She just didn't follow through. Yeah, it's definitely undercooked. So, anything else we want to get into with us, Alex? I believe that leads us to your questions. To my questions? Okay, we can jump to that. You have anything else to say, Becky, before we jump into the questions? Final I thoughts? Don't, I don't know. They might, maybe it'll tie into the questions. Okay. If it doesn't, you can just jump in after. Okay. First quick recap. Why did this book miss its mark, Alex? So we talked about the editor a little bit, and... I was trying to fathom whether it was a first or second draft that got rushed to production to capitalize on Urquhart's success with the podcast, or Urquhart doesn't have a lot of writing experience, and that first draft was atrocious, and it got edited up to something that was merely not great. So that why is... Just in that editing and in that inexperience as a writer, it's clearly something that she has not done in the past. If she's a good storyteller on Morbid, that's great. But storytelling and writing are two different things. Since reading this book and thinking about how come she can be such a good storyteller in her podcast but miss the mark here, I started realizing the, the podcast isn't so much good because her sto- of her storytelling, which you said, Alex, you could only stand about 15 minutes of it. Yeah, her, her storytelling, while not as bad as this, it's, it's not great. 
what makes the podcast fun is the banter between her and her niece and her niece making some ridiculous statements. <laughs> I understand them. Yeah, Becky, Becky <laughs> understands them. But uh, I, she tried too much. She's she wants to make this badass woman character in a STEM field. So has to be wicked smart and pretty, of course, cuz they all have to be pretty. They can't just be regular smart. And then you have the serial killer who's supposed to be super scary. And maybe in a way he is because he's kind of an incel. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not disagreeing with you. Just because he blames everyone else for his failures, even though he's the one who screws up royally. How do you miss the C5? Yeah, I hit three C5s like on my way here today. It's one thing in Firefly for Captain Reynolds to be like, I was aiming for his head while, you know, being shot himself totally different to be like holding the person very very close and you feel like you can find it like there's knobs back there yeah, what a timely reference with firefly by the way yeah i definitely agree with you guys i don't have really much to add to that so next question how is this story different from the agatha christie book we read last month structure for putting together a mystery or a thriller so i mean Comparing this book to Agatha Christie is like comparing a turd to a sunset. Like it's <laughs> I, I know it's it's, it's unfair. <laughs> I get that, but I, I said, yo, yeah. if you want to compare the, the best with you know someone else, to kind of just just to see the, the the differences. So Christie, like we said last month, is best known for writing really well plotted out stories. Like you read, like, oh, how are they going to die? Why are they dying? And She's really good at making it all make sense, even though a lot of her character development tends to be lacking. She can still give you a little bit of backstory and make you understand why the characters are doing what they're doing. We get a lot of backstory in this book, and there's only two characters to focus on, and then there were none had ten characters to focus on. And I cared more about those ten characters with only a little bit of detail about their lives than I did about these two characters, where I get all of Jeremy's family history, and I get the fact that Ren is a victim of a serial killer's assault. I didn't really care about that, and they're surrounded by basically just scarecrows with names that they talk to to help advance the plot, and there's really not much plot to be there begin with, because she hid the fact that Jeremy's story set in the past, so we don't see him planning things out. So, like, even when he his plan doesn't come to fruition like the way he wants it to, we didn't see him planning it out and being so excited. So when, it, when he's angry about it, we don't really care. And with Christy, with and Then There Were None, or even with, you know, her Poro stories, everything is so amazingly planned out, and all the motivations are there. There's always a reason Even why someone the, gets the, killed. Even the background scenery is more well done, where you you can almost be transported there in your mind. Where this, as we said, you could you could be anywhere. Just that's hot and muggy. Yeah. With like possibly even, gators. Yeah. Yeah, like we didn't read this one, but even on like Murder on the Orient Express, like the details of the train cars, it's all different, and every everybody has a story and a motive for murder. Does it, it makes... count that I saw the movie? Yeah, yeah, it's good. Sweet. Well, you know, a little point here that I really bothered me. Jeremy kept going on about gators, and never once in the bayou do we run into a gator. That would have been a great medical experimentation. Just saying. It's like she points it out. Elena writes about it constantly, multiple times in this book. And never once does it actually come to fruition for anything. They, they never even see a gate. It's never like, oh, that log over there. Ooh, it has eyes. Let's walk away quickly. Yeah, no gators whatsoever. And you just reminded me, thank you for that, that uh, you remember that line about the don't fear the reaper and he's the reaper tonight? She does that again at the end of the book because Jeremy does the most baffling thing. I don't know what... Urquhart was thinking writing this, but like he gets shot by Ren, and then somehow, like in a bayou filled with cops, nobody notices him. Swap he, out with another. He, does, he doesn't get shot by Ren. He gets shot by Will oh, because Ren right. can't yeah. pull the trigger. That's right. And, and, and that, I guess we'll get into that question. Yeah. Well, as you were right. saying, it wasn't believable. It was the plot, plot twist that then even remotely believable. Yeah. 
Well, uh, let me just do that. She uh, she doubles down on that whole, like, he is the blank tonight, because at the end he's talking about the gators, and he says, they move slickly through the muck with tails capable of incapacitating a man faster than any weapon. They are the true bayou butchers, ruthless and bloodthirsty, and tonight he'll be one of them. So she doubles down on that, going back to gators. But your question yeah. was... Is a uh, plot twist at the end even remotely you know, believable? I d- no. No. It would have been better off just to kill him. Yeah, he should have died. And she, if she's leaving it open for a sequel, like, have another serial killer. It doesn't it's, have to it's, be it's New Orleans. There's plenty of them. But, uh, yeah, no, like, he's wearing a bulletproof vest. Nobody notices. You were telling me before we were podcasting, like, bulletproof vests are big. They're bulky. They restrict your movements. Like, you know when someone is wearing one. And Particularly if they're female. Yeah. But, you know, this is a guy. I know he's a, would you? <laughs> yeah, they flatten the goodies. Anyway. <laughs> We don't notice that he's wearing a bulletproof vest, and somehow he finds another dead body and That's puts it where his dead body was so that he can escape. Yeah, it was like he was planning to get shot in the chest. It's like being shot from a number of yards away with a handgun. These things, I know in the movies, these guys are shooting their uh, Glock 9mm, a target from 50, 80 yards away. That ain't going to happen in real life. That They're probably not even going to get hit. If you're 20 yards away, that's especially in a cop that's in the heat of the moment where his partner's just been shot with a crossbow and you're seeing your forensic pathologist freeze because she's grabbed up a gun and can't shoot it. And you're like, oh, we got the serial killer here with a deadly weapon. You're just emptying your gun in his general direction. You're not you know, aiming for center mass necessarily. You're going to hit him in the arms, the legs, the chest, the head. Yeah, if this is Jeremy's grand plan to escape in real life, he would have been screwed. Yeah, and like even if he did hit center mass, you're getting hit with a projectile that's coming at you really fast and really hard, and it's going to incapacitate you. It's yeah, you bulletproof it's gonna, vest yeah. is this Hollywood cop out for why you survived getting shot. It's not, and for someone who's trying to be so accurate scientifically in this book, it makes no sense he should be walking away with bruised broken ribs and all that jazz at the the best maybe his experiments are on himself (laughs) and where did he get that spare body to swap out so no one would notice he's got spongy ribs i mean (laughs) he has more bodies just hanging around for the cops to find on his property that are freshly killed then it's like where did all these missing people come from that weren't mentioned in the book at all building up to it yeah and that's another flaw from the setting his story in the past we don't see what he's doing in the present and yeah he's like he's just got bodies stored in the bushes that aren't going to rot in the louisiana bayou muggy heat that gets referenced about five thousand times in this book and they don't get eaten by gators no gators. And there's very the little mention I mean, very little mention of the mosquitoes that would be swarming the bodies except for when it's convenient at the concert. And I mean, like maybe it was just a crime of opportunity. Like maybe like he like got shot, he fell down, looked to the side, like, Oh well, hey, look at that. Louisiana by you never know what you're gonna find. There's a dead body right here and swaps it out and walks walks away with nobody noticing. Like I don't know, like it's the end of Saw. <laughs> or you had a genie. <laughs> genie for my first wish. Get me an extra body. Okay, so next question. This is going to be a tough one. What did Elena do well in her writing? Well, I think taking it back to Agatha Christie, Agatha Christie was known for her research into methods of detecting. Like she knew her shit because she worked on it partially, and she was always she was going all around finding the different ways, fingerprinting, and all of that. And Elena, for her part about the technician, knew her stuff. So that was well researched. I'll give her that. Yeah, even if she did like ham fist in some real life serial killer stuff, obviously she knows a lot about that and the scientific breakdowns. Even if they are a little like uh, while she's performing autopsies, even if a little bland, clearly she knows her stuff. I really like the sentence uh, from chapter seven: "Life in a cubicle is truly barbaric." I think that was a fun thing for a serial killer to say. She did well with some aspects of this i found part two is a lot smoother than part one because part one is really terrible and part two is just pretty bad the yeah part two 
is it reads really fast, which I'm not just trying to you know blast through the end of the book, but you can. It's there's a lot of action going on, even if it's not particularly well done, but you can still yeah. read through really quick, and you're kind of almost but in true thriller fashion, yeah, short, excited to find out what happens next. Yeah, short chapters, fast-paced. It's. I thought at times, even with that, though, it just got kind of, she was just jumping around too much. But, but yeah, it was definitely picked up the pace for sure, and that was a relief after part one. I also wrote that uh, Katie's death is cool. So when, he kills, when he kills Katie. Uh, was she? Was, uh, she was one of the victims in the park uh, after dark. Yeah. So, what was uh, was it Mark, Katie, and Emily? Yeah, Emily, who winds up being Ren. So he kills Mark. He says that line about ladies and well, just ladies now. And then he fi- he kills Katie. Like this cool description of her getting her throat cut. I thought it was pretty good. Was Jeremy a good representation of the average serial killer? She clearly wanted to make a serial killer that was unique from other serial killers and she she did just that well she he was a mishmash of too many different killers i think she was trying to put in a little bit of everybody and it just made him seem sloppy i mean at times he's ted bundy when he's losing his shit at the end of his killing yeah when he's picking up tara like ted bundy would do yeah or she makes that direct comparison to Dahmer. yeah to Dahmer, Dahmer. that like, she insults Dahmer's methods because they were so sloppy. But Dahmer's methods aren't captivating because they're sloppy. They're captivating because of the brutality of which he killed people. And the brutality of which Jeremy kills people is not as as gripping. That's why, like, Dahmer's... People don't shut up about Dahmer no matter how much his, you know, the families of his victims want him to. Because he was such a brutal monster. But Jeremy, on the other hand, he's just an average run-of-the-mill serial killer, and he's yeah. kind of boring for either true crime or literature. Yeah, and I mean, she she put a lot of Ed Kemper into him, BTK, which... Dennis! She, which Elena, in her podcast, is always talking about how much she despises him. And as, as I said before, she really wrote Jeremy as... It was very obvious that of her dislike towards his character and it just it made you not want to to care about him as a character just like oh this guy's just as Peggy would say an incel why why would we care about him and he could uh, turn on the charm and pick someone up no problem when he needs to but then he loses shit over the simplest thing like the secretary that's buzzing him in at his work and when she says you owe me he snarls at her like no I don't and it's like we're what was where'd that come from? That made no sense. Here he is charming her, and of course we're seeing in his head how much he hates talking to her. But again, even that doesn't really make sense for someone that's supposedly being like a Ted Bundy charmer who's just trying mm-hmm. to get the adoration of someone that he could possibly go psycho on later. Yeah, and I think a big flaw, like when Urquhart's writing him, like you said, she doesn't like him. And he's got no style. He's got no substance. And it could be... He's very stylistic. There's not much to him. Or we learn a lot about him. But there's... Like, like she's just going for a shock value of his killings. And she doesn't even hit that. There's no... There's there's really nothing to him that makes him stand apart from any other killer in literature. He seems more of a mass murderer than a serial killer. Because every body seems to be part of his manifesto of why he's doing this and why he's so much smarter than everyone else, which also ties back into his incel, and apparently he was tugged as a child. His daddy didn't like him. Daddy wasn't there quite enough, but was there too often. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I know we've touched on this one a bunch, but the location in the story, was it a good one for the setup, or would she have been better off setting this in, say, the Boston metro area. And her strengths are where she knows what she's doing without having to do any research because you know, she's got a career there or she lives there or she, her hobbies take place there. Mm-hmm. Uh, she might have been to New Orleans. She might have seen some stuff about New Orleans, but she doesn't really seem interested in talking about New Orleans. 
the way I've always heard it says write what you know and you see a lot of writers they write where they live or where they grew up a place where they're intimately connected with so that they can put in those nice details that really transport a person into there and as I said there was none of that there we we had broad general locations we never heard about the famous streets or buildings any of the famous festivals that they have mm-hmm. there's yeah. there was none of that because yeah, like stephen king grew up in new england a lot of his stories are set in new england Anne rice grew up in louisiana a lot of her stories are set up in louisiana tolkien was raised in middle earth it's you know you gotta write what you know does Elena use good forensics in her story, and can she make it interesting? So something that you actually you know are learning from, or is it just like reading from a textbook? Alex was very intrigued by someone's throat being slit. I just thought that was a cool graphic. It's, it's hard to mess up a throat getting cut. But also, like, going back to, like, he cuts Katie's throat. He tries to do the same thing to Tara, but he misses her carotid artery. Very sloppy work. Yeah. Granted, he was being rushed there by the hunters that, or they're poaching, supposedly, that, again, that, that, that whole scene had made absolutely no sense. He said, goes in this area that where, where me and my dad used to go poach boar. Of course, there's no pigs there at all, but you got a bunch of hunters that are there poaching for th- said pigs, and here he is doing his own thing, and as it said, just a, the, 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 more that the scene made no sense than anything mm-hmm. and we're getting back to the the scientific stuff she does get textbooky with it she's like almost excited to write these few paragraphs where she's cutting open a body and describing the human anatomy which i mean knowing human anatomy is you know it's an important thing and it's something everyone should know but the way she presents it in this it's it is more like a like what she the way she would present it in her day-to-day job rather than describing it to the lay person who might not be interested in where the where the C5 is just tell me like oh yeah I cut open the stomach I check the check the kidneys had a uh, puncture wound what, what would you say Alex it was poorly executed <laughs> yeah <laughs> just like that joke go dad jokes to be fair we have not said where the C5 is so just for clarification for everyone it's like at the base of where your your head kind of meets your shoulders, base of your neck. It's it's very high up. When he stabs Emily, find out Ren in the back. He's stabbing her in the lumbar region. Yeah, in the lower back. Yeah, and again, that's the how he misses the spine completely makes no sense. And as someone who has deboned animals before. The, the spine, you know when your your knife hits the spine, no matter how sharp it is, it's just like any bone. and it's You're going to be digging around in there. It's not going to be as clean cut into the, the spine necessarily, unless if they're bent way forward so that it's uh, spreading the, the bones a bit. If you've ever had to, yeah, if you ever had to, like, debone something, it takes, it takes some effort. It's not just slipping the knife in. you got to jimmy the thing. <laughs> Alex. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the uh, maybe the thumbnail for this episode can just be like a diagram showing where the C five is. <laughs> well, I also just thought of I don't know if you all have read the Bone Collector. It's by Jeffrey Deaver, I believe. Very good book. Yeah. Very good movie. Yes. Oh, Denzel. Mwah. Love you. Anyway, in an accident, that particular detective has is crushed below the C5 or C4, and he can't. All he can wiggle is like a finger. Kind of like James Bond. You know what he can do with his little finger. Anyway, but he's trapped in his bed and has more ability to get us to care and tell us and explain things to us in a way that is easy to understand and comprehend for those of us that don't work in the field compared to what Ren did. I should be almost better off sacrificing some scientific accuracy for good storytelling or just any storytelling and last question i have here is why were the characters so two-dimensional even jeremy and ren were fairly two-dimensional when they weren't bouncing between total schizophrenic type personalities 
but when it got down to it, they there just wasn't much substance to the, either of them, let alone any of the side characters. So we get some backstory for both of them. We get that Ren's a victim of a pretty heinous crime. We get that Jeremy's father didn't hug him enough, that he had issues with his mom. But backstory doesn't necessarily mean that you're developing your characters. Just because it's happened to you doesn't mean I'm going to care about it. And that's just the skills of the writer to be able to take those stories and apply those emotions. There are characters that you know very little about that you can care about. Uh, she doesn't have that, those tools in her repertoire as a writer to be able to convey the characters when they're annoyed, they roll their eyes. When they're sad, they cry. Can you portray those emotions in different, more subtle ways? Maybe they're sad, but they're trying to hide it. Or or they're frustrated and they, they're trying to keep it together. There's And also, like, Ren's got a very stable life. She's really bounced back from her crimes. And Jeremy doesn't change at all from beginning to end. He's just an inconsistent, or they're both just really inconsistent people. And it's hard to get a read on who they are or how they develop throughout the story. Maybe it ties back to, with the podcast, the stories have already been told. More or less. Elena didn't write Ted Bundy or Ed Kemper. They were there in the real world. Somebody wrote the stories and then she collected them, compiled them, and turned them into a highly entertaining episode with Ash. Whereas this was her alone. Yeah, and that podcast, like they're able to bounce off each other. But Elena's writing this alone like you said, and whatever feedback her editor was giving her or her friends were giving her, it sounds like it was probably a lot of lip service that she was getting, like, oh, this is so great, you're so talented, you're so brave. And there's no real pushback, be like, I really don't care about Ren. Maybe so, she had been stabbed in the C5, I'd feel bad for her. So, conclusions. Alex? See, I wrote this one down, actually. What? Plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> Plot twist is you wrote it in Russian and can't read it right now. <laughs> hey, come right. So I wrote that it starts as a poor character study, eventually smooths into a generic st- serial killer story. So many parts of the story feel forced or unnecessary. It reads like the first draft of a book by someone with, with decent writing experience or uh, multiple drafts of somebody who doesn't have a lot of writing experience. Urquhart probably had a terrible story, got it edited up to this point. The plot twist inhibits the cat and mouse game, which gets rushed in the second half. Part two goes fast and is more readable for it, but even still, Jeremy's breakdown is ludicrous and inconsistent. Tara's attack is mostly filler, and the fact Jeremy doesn't kill Ren when he has a chance is stupid, because we didn't even talk about this. He breaks into Ren's house while she's asleep, stands over her while she's sleeping, and then just steals her ring and leaves. And then that ring really plays nothing into the rest of the story because they go into Jeremy's house and he's just sitting on the table. It would have been a much more compelling story if that was, say, in the beginning. And we're just getting the whole Jeremy's this creepy mastermind serial killer. And you get that creepy scene of him. We know almost nothing about him. He's just standing over her, watching her, and fantasizing about what he could be doing to her. Yeah, that was his MO. We got to see him torturing her because all we get is the that he had hidden, or he'd buried someone alive. He wasn't doing those incremental tortures to drive her insane. Yeah, he could have been standing at the first scene instead of him going down to the basement and pulling out Katie's nails. He could have been standing over Ren, and there wouldn't be any blood or gore, but it would have been much more tense that he's doing that. Going from, uh, instead of starting off at 10 for the torture, you're starting off at a nice three creep alert of yeah this is tense but there's really nothing Ren doesn't even know that she's being anything done to her yeah and just my final like one sentence summary is the whole thing is undercooked it's supported by some good ideas that are never brought to fruition it was clearly rushed to production to bank on the success of a podcast you have any conclusions for the book Becky I had such high hopes anything else that's it. Yeah. Just my heart breaking. 
And my conclusion, woof. <laughs> yeah, this is a terrible book. It needs major rewrites, many more attempts to iron it out. All the characters, LeRue, Will, Jeremy, Ren, need to be fleshed out, made to actually fit a mold of some sort of archetypical characters instead of just being schizophrenic and everyone's just bouncing all over the place emotional wise and whatnot we need to know more about the the victims and why they are being killed why they are being targeted we have all these texts walking through and they either need to be pared down to one or two and they get fleshed out jeremy needs to be something that's feared this whole time he has his moments but a lot of the times he's kind of a ninny he's he's not something that you're really scared of in the book there's not a lot of tense moments she can't be despised by the writer she needs to kind of lovingly create this monster i mean talking about like horror stories frankenstein and his monster that Mar- you mary shelley them both what you care about them both yeah and but mary shelley clearly cared about them both even though they're both in some ways monstrous and doing monstrous things She needs to do more showing, not telling. And again, Jeremy's a joke through the whole story. There's not a lot of good points for Elena in this story. And I still like Elena's podcast to listen to it. But this just kind of put a sour taste in my mouth. Believe it or not, it's still not the worst book I've ever read. (laughs) A title uh, is currently held by An Abundance of Catherines by John Green. Maybe next season we'll read that one. All the greenies are going to come after you for that. So bad. Kind of an interesting thesis question I came up for this month. How could we make Jeremy become a more interesting villain? Making us give a damn. Like, have him be that creepy-ass person who, in the very beginning, he's in her room and he, like, her, I don't know, her a curl or strand of hair falls in her face and he brushes it back. Because I swear to God, I would nope the fuck out of my room if I knew something like that would happen. Yeah, make him, (laughs) instead of going for shock value, make him do the things that are actually scary. So, like, standing over Ren while she's sleeping. If he had taken that ring rather than just leaving it on his coffee table, like, if he'd buried that woman alive with that ring in there, like, in the casket with her, that would have been very scary. If he was doing manipulating things like if all uh, of a sudden the, he the, the girl buried alive she did have uh ren's old bracelet that's true she did have a piece of ren's but it's also making him likable yeah but if, if she had the ring like the bracelet shows that told ren that jeremy was the person that it, it connected attacked the two her. timelines the fact if he had buried the ring with her it would tell her like he's cow's back yeah. Yeah, Cal's back, and he's been in my house. Because that was one of the... Sorry, I have little children. But that was one of the things about Hans in Frozen, is that he's a likable character, and everything he does is logical. Mm -hmm. Not because he is shown until towards the end to be a ruthless asshole, but he he supposedly cares about Anna, and he cares about Arendelle. And then, just kidding. Just kidding. Oh, and if he'd done something like killed someone that Ren loved, like if he killed Ren's husband, or if he killed, uh, was it Will? John LaRue was the main detective that she followed. Will was just the side. Yeah, well, she killed Will, or she killed LaRue, one of Ren's confidants. Uh, Even killing one of her techs at that point would have been something. Or even introduce someone younger, as he tended to target younger people, like have give Ren a young friend well, or said, yeah, a mentor had, yeah, had that the, she could the, mentor the, and then kill that person. So you had the, the young text if you had fleshed a couple of them out and then one of them got killed as like she's a one of her mentees getting killed that would have been definitely a bones moment. Well not even yeah. killing them outright but slowly torturing them like chopping off a finger and then sending mm. the finger to her. Yeah and you could do th- and, yeah you could do cool things like the young female mentee is at lunch and Jeremy sits down at her table and work, starts working his charm on her and she's falling for him. And then next thing you know, she's locked in his basement. That would be genuinely terrifying. And like, 
you know, her body parts are getting mailed to Ren, things like that. It's a bigger connection than just someone getting killed. It's someone Ren cares about getting killed, and that makes the reader care about it more. And mind games would have been great, too. So not only does he come in her house and maybe take that ring and take that bracelet and brush the strand of hair, but subtly move things throughout the house. Because then you're like, did I do that? Did did my husband do that? Did my niece did that? Did my house cleaner do that? Just but there's gaslight like the hell out well, of her. Yeah. Well, even just taking articles of clothing, going through her underwear drawer, say, you know, something that's very intimate, that's... She's going to be like, this is not something that would normally be shipped around, but this isn't how I remember seeing it last. It's like that room that I used to have, and I was taking a nap in my room, and he painted my nails. <laughs> Did you nope out of there? I would have noped. I lived with him for a few more months. He was a nice guy. I think Alex is lucky he survived. He made me look real pretty. <laughs> you are pretty, my dear. But yeah, and I, th- I think if Elena wanted to make him more interesting base him off of either one serial killer instead of comparing him to three or four or try to make him more original and not be comparing him to any of these other famous serial killers. Yeah, kind of going with uh, Agatha Christie. Like she, When she had serial killers in her story, she created whole new things like was it, the ABC murders, a whole new serial killer for that. She didn't go with what was in, what's already been done. She created something new and engaging. And on top of it, Elena was kind of shooting herself in the foot. She kept belittling Jeremy, even in his own chapters. She needed to stop judging him and get into his head and create this fascinating character. She needed to make him actually thinking thoughts that you would expect him to think as a psychopath that's plotting out murders instead of just you know saying how disgusting he is, how pathetic he is and making him seem like this emasculated weakling when the most minor thing doesn't happen just perfectly she needs to have someone that's strong and powerful that Ren needs to learn to overcome instead of someone that's just happens to trip and fall in front of her just perfect for her and I mean going into his past his past wasn't that extraordinary I mean he had a few shock values but have something that's truly like would mess a kid up, like his dad getting eaten by a gator. <laughs> yeah, something that was truly traumatic in his life. I mean, you know, even his dad never really beat him. He just took his son out hunting at night, or he'd see his dad get drunk and argue with mom, and yeah, maybe they got implied uh, domestic abuse, but it was never. Anything that would be enough to send someone into this kind of just rage. I mean, there's you know no rage against his mom, and he's targeting all these women, and that's a classic serial killer thing of oh mom was weak, so I'm taking it out on all these women because mom was weak. There there was none of that psych- psychological background to to explain why he is the way he is. Well, Anything else? We uh, beat this dead horse enough. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all I have for it. Can't can't recommend this one. It's, how, how many stars would you give it, Alex? Uh, well, on Goodreads, I give it a I give it a one star review. I was debating two star, like it almost saves itself at the end, but no, it is. It's not a good book. It's it's unfortunate. It does have interesting premises, but it is it vastly under delivers. What about you, Becky? What would you rate it? I would use this book for blackout poetry because you get to rip the pages out. <laughs> okay, then. I I think on Goodreads, I originally rated it three stars more just to be kind. And then I kind of like, yeah, I, I can't do that. It's definitely a one-star book. Yeah, don't don't be kind. Make them do their job. Okay. Uh, so uh, well, Luckily, though, uh, the next book is one that I chose, and this one is going to be a real horror show. Rock, rock, rock. An abundance of Catherines? <laughs> oh, you wish. No. This book is... Uh, I, got, I want two older books in a row, actually. because Agatha Christie from 1940s. This one's from 1963. Classic Anthony Burgess novel, A Clockwork Orange. 
So why did you pick that one, Alex, after I just tortured you with uh, this book? This book's been a longtime favorite of mine. I read it back in high school. It's one of the books that made me a reader. The way Burgess uses language in this book for someone who has such disdain for this book. This is one of those famous books that's hated by its author. Uh, but the, his, the language that he uses and the, you know, the story is shocking in many ways. And it's it's very in, interesting read. There's never really been anything quite like it before or after. Don't lie. It's because the main character's name is Alex. There's another character named Joe in it, too. I know. Ah, who knew? <laughs> I actually forgot it. I just I, I just finished it today, so we're going to record it at some point soon. But uh, I had forgotten that there was a character named Joe in the story as well. And, and he gets to replace Alex yeah. for a uh, family favorite. Yeah. He steals my room, son of a gun. And your parents. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I was reading that when Becky was in the room. I actually put that on the book. I like, Becky, you're not going to believe this. And I then went into way more detail than she yeah. needed. Yeah, we'll get into this more next time. But I actually found Joe to be like the he comes in part three, and he's like this voice of judgment from on high that yeah, yeah, yeah. So Holy shit. that kind of tells Alex what he has in store for him. It's 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 pretty fun. Yeah, so that's gonna be our book next month. Hope you enjoyed this. Thank you, Becky, for joining us today. You're it welcome. It was much appreciated. Anytime you. Want to read a bad book with us? That's fine. If it's a good one, we'll probably ask you to sit out. But otherwise, <laughs> I adore your enthusiasm for my presence. Oh yeah. So yeah, if you like this podcast, follow us, uh, subscribe, like, comment, all that fun stuff. Uh, we have an email, kendallbookworms at gmail dot com. We have an Instagram, kendallbookworms. Very creative, original. So yeah, follow us on that, and if any comments, please be kind. Alex is a sensitive soul, and he cries easily when people are mean, so it's an ugly sight. He's, a, yeah. he's an ugly crier. Oh yeah, yeah, he's got all puffy and bloated, and I cry and I fart at the same well, time. I, actually, you know, you know what, let's, let's take it back. We were really mean to Elena here. You can be mean to us on this one, too. We'll, we'll toughen our skins for, for this one podcast. And, uh, yeah, give us your worst. Yeah, there might be a lot of arc heads out there that are just going no ballistic. No death threats, please. Yes. De- death That's threats, not nice. Yeah, death threats aren't, aren't allowed. Send me your best death threats. So, I guess that's it. Alex, you want to get us out of this? Yep. So, until next time, I'm Alex. And I'm Joe. I'm Becky. And this has been... Bookworms.